It's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, this is a presentation uh, that is, was put together by myself and Carolyn Nice, who was a PhD student of mine. She's an architect. And you can imagine an architect and a geographer working together. We have different languages and such. And that's my way of apologizing for a lot of wording on the screen. That's partly for us to know, to remember, and to get to know each other's work, which you'll see in orange is, uh, will be the main points that come out that you will see. Um, so, uh, so this is. Oh, and this is a book that came out of her work, um, Participatory Design and Self-Building in Shared Urban Open Spaces. It just came out this past year. Um, so an outline, I'll start with sort of the conceptual overview, historical review of um, gardens in New York City, um, human rights claims for urban land tenure. This comes out of uh, research that Carolyn did and that uh, we worked on together, parts of it, where I brought in my perspectives and a short conclusion. So four ways of thinking about uh, human rights, right to the city, human rights, right to adequate food, and, and right to garden. So when we think about a right to the city, a lot of the framing is coming from Lefebvre, Lefebvre theories of space, more geographical, um, and uh, it comes up with this idea of, uh, there's a great intersection with um, uh, human right to food. One issue is, uh, relates to land tenure, the defense against loss of homes and neighborhoods, very much connected to what is now known as the uh, voluntary guidelines on right on responsible governance of land, uh, water, and um, other resources. Uh, the commons, um, an area which is growing in rapidly in um, in sort of a theoretical framework, especially with this new book, Food of Commons, that's coming out this year, this month. Um, the collective, um, pr the production of self-determining cooperatives, urban metabolism, the idea of transforming the self and space um, through uh, different kinds of actions that people make when they move through space, including the making of gardens and social power. Um, in the context of human rights, we can apply this related to um, international UN treaty law, um, looking at relationships between community rights holders and the gov as rights holders and the government as duty bearers, looking particularly at issues of empowered self-determination, co-governance. Um, transparency to be able to hold governments accountable, the legal availability of recourse mechanisms and principles of non-discrimination, among others. So the idea being to apply these concepts. In the, concept, in, uh, in the context specifically of the right to adequate food and nutrition, there is a way of applying these three ways which are constructed as how a right to food can be accomplished. And one is that you produce, you grow, you forage your own, you, achieve, you have money that you have to get to be able to purchase um, or otherwise trade for food and where those options are not available, social protection. And in all of these kinds of ways, there is the, um, the context of needing access to an environment where that's um, possible, where there has to be access to land, water, air, and or decent work. Um, and there has to be these um, sort of resources 
need to encompass cultural expression and community solidarity. The fourth frame is the right to garden. And the most critical point here um, is that urban spaces can be used to produce food. But the right to garden, as people talk about it, is not necessarily about food production. It's really more often about the right to determine available open space. And so when we talk about uh, the right to garden, it's not necessarily about food only. All right, so there we go. Um, the socio-historical context. Um, in New York City, uh, there was the experience in microcosm of what was happening globally in the early 70s of this um, global economic recession. Um, and one of the results in New York was that landlords could not pay taxes, and their lands would be ceded to the city. They were abandoned, they were disused. If they, did, if they didn't want to cede their land to the city, their buildings, there were many not so mysterious fires by which they could absorb um, insurance payments. Um, it resulted in uh, terrible demolition, abandoned buildings, um, but also in this, the construction of new open spaces um, that community residents began to, uh, in some cases, take over and turn into, and these would be marginalized community, communities that were still remaining in these, um, in a sense, violated spaces. Um, and it, it was through groups like Green Gorillas, you may have heard of them, that um, spaces were cleaned up, the rubble was cleaned up, and there were different kinds of expressions of turning the space into something that suited the community. So um, these gardens expressed a kind of social power of the people who remained when all the finance, all the city governance, when it all left, the remaining residents um, became involved in cooperative projects to reclaim spaces, both for residential purposes and for not exactly entertainment, but I mean to places where you could get outside your home and be with community. So um, already in the 70s, the city of New York began this Green Thumb program in recognition of the work that um, the community was undertaking, began to prepare leases for gardening groups and, and resource materials to help build. Um, through the 80s and 90s, there began to be a, an economic resurgence, and all these lands, these open spaces, became very interesting to new financial interests wanting to move in and develop. And there was this own kind of urban land grabbing and gentrification, and forms of resistance through social movement recourse and municipal renegotiation. One of the outcomes has been um, these community garden rules, um, but it was only through that kind of resistance that um, some of the gardens around the city were saved. Um, so the focus was always um, to try to build these gardens in concert with the green thumb and community organizing according to the preferences of the neighborhoods. So you'll notice here, for example, the focus is not so much on food production. It's on shade, it's on greenery, it's on green, right? 
some sort of oasis from the surrounding built environment. <coughs> Um, there are still over 600 uh, community gardens in the city. Um, this, I'm going to be talking about the area here in the Bronx. Um, and this struggle to maintain and expand gardens continues. So now I want to talk about uh, the research um, the, in three parts. The resistance in the Bronx um, to uh, the private investors trying to move in, participatory design of communal projects, and this is something very specific that Carolyn Meese has brought to it as an architect actually working with Green Hill, and then a movement towards participatory planning, essentially co-governance and comprehensive land use planning. Um, so, uh, we are going to be talking about this Melrose neighborhood in the South Bronx. Um, and um, the issues here, the critical issues are that the neighborhood uh, residents organize themselves into a group called Los Quiveros, that was a largely Puerto Rican um, population. And what they wanted was to retain their housing in the face of this um, effort of, of taking over the land um, and, um, and the gardens. And they also had this group called War Gardens. And what they did to fight the city was they collaboratively developed their own plan, their own sort of, well, it's like a shadow report to a government report, right? It was a shadow plan. Um, and they worked on it, um, sort of semi-secretly with green thumb uh, people, and um, presented it to the city. So um, I want to show you two of the gardens there. So Elaki um, In this case, the gardeners were able to force developers to revise their plan and build around the existing garden. And in the second case, Centro Popur and Con Fiolo, the um, garden was forced to move and give way. But in moving, they received um, space where they could rebuild. And um, and when they rebuilt, it was very important for them to build in their cultural tradition. Um, and uh, this is part of, part of what I'll be talking about, part of Carolyn's uh, work is helping develop these new kinds of construction that the city would accept on public land. So, that also met the cultural needs of the populations who were uh, communally um, organizing the development of their gardens. These are casitas, little houses um, um, from the, this new criollo um, garden, and um, very common to uh, Caribbean um, Puerto Rico. So um, the idea is that it's not only organizing around designing a garden, but it's, it's this idea of creating um, structures, creating built, different kinds of built environments that create a seed, seeds of social power. Um, and uh, especially if they um, convey the con and, and meet the community needs. So um, one of the strategies was to work on these design charrettes where you would have um, architects uh, and landscape architects working with community groups to um, consider how to develop the space to meet their needs. Um, oh, and here the idea of of trying to build a relationship between 
the rights holders of, of the city and the, and the, of the neighborhood and the, the city itself as duty bearers. I kind of stress this in part because I think it has to be part of a city's plan. We don't have it yet, but that's the goal. Um, and that this process has to incorporate these structures of, um, of human rights that are called the Panther Principles based on this participation, accountability, non-discrimination, transparency, human dignity, empowerment, rule and rule of law. These are all inherent in this process of garden design and urban land tenure. Um, so, um, so here, this is uh, a process of it essentially um, this effect the idea of of when when the body moves through space, interacting with other people, both this person and the space are transformed, and the way that the space. Uh, is metabolized in a sense, is constructed, influences the way a person is. I can feel it walking through this building. What an amazing building. And it, it, it transforms the way you work, the way you feel. And that's the idea here, to build um, a, a garden that has that capacity. Um, so for the residents, the, the priority was tree shade and sitting areas. That was what was going to draw people. The food production was important, and, and it was included, but it was not the first priority. And that it was critical to take into consideration in order to get community to become involved in active co-governance with the city. So this third part, participatory planning and comprehensive land use plan. Um, this is the idea that you move from this sort of cooperation with green thumb, which is this radical element inside the Parks and Rec Department in New York, to moving to make uh, to, to mainstream gardens. And um, so this idea of a master plan for a city. Um, has to be designed as a mechanism of cooperation, communication, and recourse with residents. So it's the idea that the more engaged residents are, the more they will become involved with the construction of these plans and push um, the city to engage with um, uh, garden development and, and protection. Um, when you have that sort of level of engagement, you have a system of, of um, having measurable goals, objectives, and monitoring indicators to be able that the city is invested in, so and with which the uh, residents can hold the government accountable to maintain the burdens. Um, and you have a living document that is going to exist for multiple years and is subject to um, periodic review. Um, so this is one of the examples of the participatory planning. There are up updates, uh, but there are others. Um, this one uh, included community gardening for the first time. Um, because of the increased engagement of residents in the development. So, in conclusion, the human right to garden requires empowered control over land tenure or tenure, actually responsible governance of um, land, water, air, and other resources. Um, it reimagines or remakes or metabolizes the self and the city in forms of the commons. It progresses through participatory social power, more than <coughs> food production, for food security, although those are still critical aspects. If you don't save the land, you won't even get to the food security piece. 
Um, and uh, it requires democratic dialogue with local governments, with the local state. And in the long run, the critical thing is to protect the land and be able to confront speculative development. So I thank you. I um, I don't have any questions, but it's, uh, I don't think we have much time. Thank you for having us here. It's a pleasure. We flew in yesterday and we fly back um, tonight, so it's really a short, short trip. But it's nice to be here to share our some early results and to raise some questions. Um, so the presentation outline for today is that we give a short introduction on the research project, then on urban agriculture embedded in the food system. I um, will quickly introduce the two case study areas, um, Cape Town and Maputo, and will then speak a bit about my food system research, handing over to Anya, who will then uh, give an introduction into her research on innovation and practice, introducing a bit um, the methodological approach on the innovation assessment, and raise a short outlook on the next steps and on the early results. So, Fisama is a project we are embedded in. It's um, funded by the German Ministry for Food and Agriculture. Um, it's an international and interdisciplinary research project. We have universities as partners. It's a high university in uh, Berlin. They are in charge for livestock research. It's the University of the Western Cape in Cape Town, and it's the UN University in Eduardo Magdalena in Maputo. There are also different non-state actors involved as project partners. And the idea is not only to gather scientific knowledge, it's also to share this knowledge back to farmers and practitioners in the field. Um, within this project, we have four PhD students in total to in Mozambique and we both in Berlin. My research is on uh, the role of urban agriculture in the wider food system. And uh, also raising the question what impact has urban agriculture on income generation, on uh, food security, and to raise the future question how could urban agriculture be a bit more inclusive, be a bit more sustainable within the wider food system. And I guess working on an innovation and knowledge system, assessing that, and um, also raise the question how could a better innovation system lead to a more sustainable. In the two case study areas. Um, we have the context of a very strong urbanization in sub Saharan Africa, Southern Africa. This is a drawing from, uh, from last year in Kalicho, one of the biggest townships in Cape Town, and it shows um, this, this challenge of urbanization. So then I would like to raise the figures that. In Cape Town, until or within the next 10 years, urbanization will increase for 11% and for 15%. All over in Africa, urbanization plays a very strong role. It strongly stresses the food systems. Um, more and more people are moving from rural areas to the cities. South Africa already quite urbanized, with 60% is expected to have an urbanization rate uh, by 80%. Whereas Mozambique is the least urbanized country in the southern African region, but expected to have an urbanization rate of a bit more than 50%. So the context of urban agriculture in the urban food system is uh, or was also raised by um, within the sustainable development goals. So it's SDG 2, which addresses uh, Sri Lanka, SDG 11, which addresses uh, sustainable cities. And it's quite interesting if you compare both our plans or both concepts, the SDG 2 is not raising the context of, of urban, of the urban space, and uh, the SDG 11 is not raising the context of food. So these two SDGs are not really interlinked. Uh, and as the conceptual approach refers back to SDG 9, uh, which addresses innovations. And more and more, especially with the food crisis 10 years ago, this question on access to food and access to healthy food um, came up and came to political discussions. And it's not only um, 
addressing in rural contexts. So food production is not the challenge only for the rural areas to feed the cities. Um, there have been two very huge household surveys in, in both case studies before, case study areas before, which already answered a bit our project research question. And the, the, or the answer is that urban agriculture in Cape Town hardly play any role because only 2% of, of households are somehow involved in urban agriculture, income is quite low. And also in, in Maputo, where around 20% of the households are involved, <coughs> urban agriculture plays a role towards income generation, but not really addressing food security challenges. So based on, on these uh, surveys, we did uh, some future research with observations. We assessed everyone involved in urban agriculture. So this is Cape Town that I've said. There are around, depending on season and depending on drought situations, between 50 and 80 uh, community gardens farming in the townships. There are around 5,000 home gardeners trained to farm in their backyards. Uh, there is a very interesting case in Cape Town within the urban metropolitan area. There's a 3,000 hectare area which is um, farmland, in which really feeds the city. Uh, urban agriculture is highly promoted by NGOs, by the city itself, um, as a solution to urban hunger. Um, and the research I already mentioned showed that the impact on food security is quite low. Maputo has um, two main areas where urban agriculture is organized in farmers' associations. There are around 10,000 farmers uh, farming. Um, a lot of people have their backyards, and one can say that around 40,000 persons are economically benefiting from urban agriculture. Farmers are mainly producing leafy vegetables compared to Cape Town where farmers produce a wide variety. So I look at urban agriculture through the lens of the food system approach and I refer to Ericsson who uh, says that a well-functioning urban food system can be regarded as one that ensures a high level of food security to residents while simultaneously contributing to sustainable social and economic development. So that's quite important because what we observe also is that urban agriculture is not only addressing um, the production questions, it has a lot of more, more benefits. Um, and I will later explain the method, but that's just a quick overview. Uh, we do the research with a case study approach. We use quite a variety of methods, mainly participatory group discussions and having farmers involved in the research and um, having them also within the team as kind of co-researchers, so they put in diaries, they take photos, we spend a lot of time in their gardens from joining them, cooking, joining them, um, buying food, so we really got good insights in urban farmers' life. These are very first conclusions uh, on the food system and challenges. I just highlight um, maybe the marketing aspects. In both cities, farmers are really struggling to market their produce. So there is in both cities hardly any um, market for organic produce because people want to buy cheap uh, food. People also prefer to go to the supermarket because it's more cheap and the food is clean. And we realize that this is um, a huge challenge for all of them. Also, one similar thing for both cities is that they are quite challenged by climate change. So Cape Town was facing the drought in the last two years, what was challenging in Maputo, floods in winter and also drought in summer. Um, with the farmers together, we looked at food and we created a map with them, which shows where urban gardens are. So they are mainly, in, they are mainly here in the townships. You can see that uh, supermarkets are around the townships, so access to food, especially in townships, is quite challenging. And one main question arose in this research is why do people don't go to the, these gardens, why they don't use these gardens as source of food? So this map was one, one of the main outcomes of the research. Sorry, because you can't see them in the back, the supermarkets are the red squares. Uh, and you can really see the distribution where they are. Mm. So township 
down there, as you showed, and then that's come up. It's, so yes, you can say that in the townships, or outside of the townships, in the more privileged white areas of Cape Town, there are eight times more uh, supermarkets compared to the um, townships where due to apartheid regime, people of color and black South Africa are still segregated within the city of Cape Town. So being a farmer in Cape Town means also that farmers produce uh, food they don't eat because they sell it or they try to sell it through NGOs to a high class market. Uh, we found out in our in service we conducted that farmers can only do farming if they receive social grants, so they are really subsidized by NGOs. Uh, but then also show that it's quite insane to claim um, urban agriculture as panacea to food security if one can only be an urban farmer if this person is subsidized by a state or by NGO. And that farmers assume with a bigger market access they can um, have more income or can create more income. What was also quite interesting in Cape Town is that farmers throw their food away if they don't have a market because their food habits are not the ones um, they produce more, like producing asparagus or mint or different or artichokes, for example. Um, in Amut, it's the other way around. Farmers also um, produce what they eat. Um, they sell it mainly directly from the field and they try to have a quick turnover. So they sell a whole bed of lettuce or a whole bed of cabbage and they use a lot of um, pesticides to produce as quick as possible. So my question generally is how can urban agriculture be relocated in the urban food system or need to be changed? How could um, niche market be addressed? How to get out of this dependency from NGOs, from policy? Um, how could urban agriculture fill in the gap in the urban food deserts? So as we have seen in townships, are urban food deserts because there's hardly access to good food? And um, how could then, in the next step, urban agriculture also contribute to other benefits like greening the city to social benefits and alleviate urban poverty? I will hand over to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, coming back to my topic, urban uh, agriculture and uh, innovation. Um, and my focus is more looking um, uh, in the aspect of how an urban oh, innovation can contribute to a more sustainable urban agriculture. And this uh, assumption is that urban agriculture can contribute to food and nutrition security, but must be adopted uh, adequately adequately involving uh, different actors in the process. Um, Agroecology innovations within the farming system can be a promising way reaching the SDGs <coughs> in the beginning, but need to be disseminate, disseminated considering also the demand of the principal users, um, which are the urban farmers, because they are often not um, considered in the research or asked, uh, etc. Um, in both cases, um, it's visible that there's a low level of dissemination of innovation, of sustainable innovation, and also knowledge, as in the case of Maputo, as we call it, uh, explains, that uh, there's a really high use of pesticides and very little knowledge on how to apply more sustainable production methods. So my research question are, what are innovations in general, in the context of urban agriculture? in this presentation within the production, but with the idea to uh, also investigate with regard to commercialization and consumption, and, and then develop a set of indicators what makes an innovation um, a good practice. Um, and to look into detail who adopted, adopted those innovations and why, what are the drivers and barriers for farmers, multiplicators and farmers to adopt innovations in this context, and therefore also develop a good practice of uh, dissemination. And what criteria for an urban agriculture uh, innovation system um, um, can be derived from this perspective as we do our research in the urban space, because normally innovations are addressed in the rural area. 
Um, and therefore, to do a theoretical contribution towards a debate of agricultural information systems. So just coming back from to Maputo, because my focus knows uh, I've more worked uh, until now with Maputo, so I'm uh, talking more about Maputo now. Uh, this is Maputo, and this is the green belt of Maputo, the two spikes you can see. And this is um, this is a very huge space. This is a very huge space for urban agriculture, and the totally is yes, um, um, forty thousand people are benefiting from this activity, and there are ten thousand organized farmers doing urban agriculture. So it's significant um, in in Maputo. Yeah, these are some impressions. And from Maputo, they are, they have uh, the university is doing a lot of research on it. The city has its own uh, extension service, but it's not normally in place within cities. Um, and they have a bio, you know, access to information for the farmers, and then, like also mentioned, the cafe. Um, and they are distributing also uh, fertilizers to the farmers, also organic uh, um, fertilizers. But uh, on the other hand, there are several input suppliers, um, and they have GMO seeds, and farmers are not aware of it. And there are some initiatives uh, addressing more organic produced vegetables and also selling via a box team. Um, yeah, and uh, there are a lot of farmers group meetings trying to disseminate information uh, on this topic. So now I'm going a little bit to the concept and the theoretical framework. Um, yeah, what is meant by innovation and agricultural or an agricultural innovation um, is a process whereby individuals or individuals or organizations bring new or existing processes into use for the first time. This means that new knowledge is in place. It's not uh, an invention. It must not be something new, but just for the context. In this case, organic fertilizers, for example, for the farmers. Dissemination is a process uh, in which with new knowledge of communication and via certain channels uh, within a given time disseminates amongst the actors. Um, and in this context, uh, sustainability is the one factor in our research. Innovation is seen as a driver of sustainability. And new knowledge on sustainability. This practice can lead to a more sustainable development. Yeah, and uh, my first uh, research question is what, what criteria make an innovation a good practice? And normally a good practice, it's not only a practice that is good, but uh, that is somehow proven to work well and produce good results and um, that can be shared so that a greater number of people or the farmers can benefit from it. Um, and in this case, analytic framework is based on Hancock. He did it for the agricultural innovation system. Um, the first step is to identify the innovation based on the given definition, to look at the state of practice or the adoption rate, to look in detail how it was initiated, self-initiated, or by a broker um, or research, to look in detail its bottom-up or top-down. Is it a single case of the success? Um, run by itself or also <coughs> by a broker and to look in detail what are the drivers and barriers in, in this <coughs> case. Um, as Nicole already mentioned, we both used uh, a mixed method approach, multiple food system aspect, the urban agriculture and the innovation aspect, and our main unit of research um, and were the urban farms in both cities or the urban gardeners, or the, um, yeah, the urban gardeners in Cape Town. Uh, and in the city of Maputo, we um, focused on two districts and the peri-urban area of Maputo, both disadvantaged communities, uh, and in Cape Town also in the, in the Cape Flats. And there we re our unit of research were the market and backyard gardeners. There are two single case studies. Um, and in Maputo, it was possible to obtain uh, a representative sample um, and we interviewed 10% of all uh, households active in urban agriculture. But this was followed by a weighted sample with organic farmers to deepen the results. And in Cape Town, it was uh, from the beginning on a weighted sample. 
because the access was really what well, was not easy in the case that's also for us. Um, the instrument we were we used, we have a sure literature review, work on point, a situation analysis, field observation, baseline study, participatory participatory group discussion, uh, and research uh, and the research farm approach. And what you want to analyze is with the qualitative content, content analysis, at least the qualitative data. The baseline study are mostly quantitative. Um, and we are now in the descriptive phase, but we also, on certain questions, we want to see what correlations or things we have to, for example, education, language, communication can be derived. Um, and this was, this is also ongoing. We have a lot of, we did a lot of expert interviews not just within the innovation system, also with, um, yeah, with the question regarding food, food system, and it's multidimensional and multi-level. We um, interviewed several NGOs, extension service media, policy maker, and actors um, from the private sector until we reached a situation level of certain questions. And also, we want to analyze this via qualitative content analysis and we were thinking to, after we had all this data analyzed, to, to um, do a final validation and a validation with the relevant stakeholders to be at the, to be sure that we are maybe right. <laughs> so what criteria make an innovation a good practice? Um, this is a dynamic model. It seems quite complex. Oh. <laughs> but just to give uh, uh, two examples, um, what are, it, um, what is our idea behind? Um, the, this, um, the, the good practice is considered here above, and it's seen here, um, it was bottom up and it was top down. Um, and the criteria is that it was, uh, that is highly diffused, so it can be both a good practice. Um, <coughs> in the case of the fruit trees in Maputo, every second uh, uh, farmer, as a fruit tree on his plot. Um, and it was initiated by one agent, but it's a self-running innovation. The other case is the um, biopesticides in Maputo. This was initiated by an NGO, but it's highly diffused, and this contributes also to, to what's a more sustainable agriculture. Um, and uh, in the analysis, I will look into detail what was, because it's diffused and there were some drivers, and when it's not diffused, but like the uh, participatory guarantee system in the pool to contribute into sustainable development, why well, it's not diffused. Um, and uh, looking in detail, yeah, and to, as, um, yeah, to think about what makes this innovation uh, sustainable, as it should contribute to sustainable development, and what is then meant really by a good practice. And some early results from the Pluto with regard to adoption of sustainable <coughs> innovation. Um, in total, we could identify more than 20 innovations. Um, and it's, it differs. They are initiated either top down by an innovation broker or bottom up from farm to farm approach. Um, and in the case of biopesticides, it was top down and uh, there was an NGO as an innovation broker working for six years with the farmers on this topic. Um, thousand farmers were trained, 300 adopted um, these techniques and more than half of the farmers, uh, they, uh, these are the baseline results, they know at least that sustainable urban agriculture uh, or uh, that production without chemicals has something to do with sustainable agriculture and that it's somehow good for them. And this, um, yeah, this shows that the dissemination <coughs> works in this case. And the main motivation of farmers were the economic benefit, but also food security, so healthy aspects came in. Um, the process to uh, involve uh, different actors, farmer extension workers, NGO, and policy levels, so that this network um, was very, very important that this innovation came to the farmers. Um, it didn't work with the commercialization of certified products by the participatory guarantee system. This is the certification scheme, because um, in the beginning it worked, 
same NGO <coughs> that she brought up, but no, there is no NGO in place really behind to promote this. Um, and the link to market was hindering further discrimination. So these are also criteria seen when it comes to the um, dissemination for innovation, also for practitioners, practitioners to be considered. So the conclusion, how can innovation be able to contribute to a more sustainable urban agriculture? Well, first try the conclusion, and innovation must be considered yeah, in the first place as a good practice if, when the, um, for the execution and innovation broker is needed in the case of Maputo. Um, and the dissemination by works via a farm, <coughs> farm approach and by a broker. It's not just a question of just bottom up or just top down. And it needs to be involved, uh, it should involve in actors, the agricultural innovation system, not just one actor but from different uh, levels. So, thank you very much <laughs> to all of you and for sure to all farmers we interviewed and our research colleagues and partners involved in this research and also thanks to Stephen making this happen. And we are happy for your feedback. Mm -hmm. <laughs>